Welcome to the Dimensions of Recovery, Keys for Creating Recovery-Friendly Communities. Allow me to introduce the panel for today. We have Emily Burkhead, who is the Executive Director for West Virginia Alliance of Recovery Residents, Dr. Jeremy Husted, Assistant Professor and Medical, Medical Director, Inpatient Dual Diagnosis Unit, WVU Medicine Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psycho Psychiatry, Deborah Davis, the Executive Director of One Voice, and Ashley Shaw, Director of CORE with Marshall Health. We also have Susie Mullins, the coordinator for the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network joining us today. She will handle all questions with chat and she wanted a moment just to tell you all about her program before we begin. Thanks, Terry. Um, and hopefully you can hear me. And Terry has been an awesome uh, co-chair of this uh, planning committee for today. And uh, we appreciate everybody's willingness to be on the panel and, and hope you've uh, enjoyed the morning so far. Um, I realized that I hadn't asked anyone to speak very briefly about the Collegiate Recovery Network. And I think it's a vital part of uh, creating um, a recovery friendly community. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there for folks that aren't aware of the West Virginia Collegiate Recovery Network. We have seven schools in our network and we collaborate with West Virginia University, which was the first collegiate recovery program in the state. Um, so we have, uh, I think all of our collegiate recovery peers on the session today. So um, folks can put in the chat what school they're with and their contact information. And just know that we are here to provide support services for people who are interested in going back to school or current students. So thank you, Terry. Thanks. Okay, um, SAMHSA defines recovery as the process of change through which people improve their health and wellness, live, excuse me, live self-directed lives and strive to reach their potential. The four major dimensions in support is um, our health, home, purpose, and community. And Emily, I'm gonna start with you this morning. Would you please tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, so I'm Emily Burkhead. I'm the Executive Director of the West Virginia Alliance of Recovery Residences. Um, we have been contracted with the state, with the Bureau of Behavioral Health and the Office of Drug Control Policy to oversee and certify, um, and by certify we mean credential, um, non-treatment recovery residences. Um, so when we talk about recovery residences, we're talking about, um, again, we're not talking about treatment. Um, recovery residences are um, safe and stable living environments for people to initiate and sustain recovery. Um, so most people talk about these places as sober living facilities. That's kind of the common lingo, but we actually have four different levels of care. <clears throat> Excuse me. So everything from Oxford House to um, like a recovery point, which is a larger scale facility that often gets called treatment, they all fall into different levels, but we classify them all as recovery homes. Um, so the reason this is important is because um, substance use disorder is a chronic condition, meaning it's long term. People will deal with this over a period of time. Um, those of us in recovery know that we will deal with this our entire lives. Um, and typical treatment approaches have been uh, more acute, um, meaning immediate um, emergency and, and short term. Um, so when we look at, um, you know, the, the typical treatment model, what we're seeing is that um, there's not an emphasis on, on post-treatment um, post recovery maintenance, you know, working with people over time. So what happens after they go to treatment? Um, and, and the deal is that recovery is not just getting sober. Um, recovery is also with that an improvement in global health, meaning physical, mental, spiritual, social, but also um, citizenship, which is positive community integration. And I think Deborah and Ashley are going to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but it's, it's all of these aspects of the person's life. Um, and, and getting sober is not the whole picture. So if, for anybody that's tried to lose weight or start a new habit, you know, that that usually doesn't, it's not, it's not usually a 
full commitment um, done deal within 28 days. You know, for someone who starts using drugs or alcohol at the age of 12 and may not try to get sober until 28, 30, 35, you know, that's years, decades of, of a way of life, behavior, um, coping skills that they're trying to change. And a lot of that comes from, um, from serious trauma, from abuse, um, from, from physical mental disorders um, that take time to, to work with. So recovery residences um, are sort of like a next step after, after whatever treatment that you go through, um, if you're fortunate enough to go through treatment, um, where you can live with other people who are working on the same goals as you. So other people that are, are getting sober, staying sober, working on their recovery, um, and the recovery environments vary a lot depending on the level of care. Um, but the two consistencies across the board are that the, the, the physical environment, the house that you're living in is drug and illicit non-prescribed alcohol or non-prescribed drug free, drug and alcohol free. Um, and also that um, we, we talk about uh, the social model, which is this peer to peer support. Um, so that means somebody who's in recovery working with somebody else who's in recovery or looking for recovery, and that helps them have that social aspect. <clears throat> so we call that the social model. So those are the two consistencies. Um, so that's why recovery residences are important. Um, the issue has been that most of these programs and facilities have been largely unregulated. Um, there is some kind of regulation internally. It really varies from house to house, like the Oxford model. They are completely self-regulated. They do have outreach workers here in West Virginia, but not everywhere. Um, but there's not really staffing or oversight. Um, and then our level four, which is our highest level of care, actually has, has much more um, in terms of like administration, oversight, sometimes bringing in clinical uh, folks, things like that, um, but it really varies across the board. Um, externally, they are obviously held to state, local, federal laws, um, and then any third-party payers. So if they get state funding, for example, they have oversight by the state, or if they are HUD-funded, they have oversight by HUD. Um, but for the most part, there has not been um, anything to say uh, that there needs to be some kind of quality standard, safety standard, anything like that. So the National Alliance of Recovery Residences was formed in 2011, and that's exactly what they did. They created a standard metric. Um, there's 100 quality indicators um, for safety, and, and um, really the emphasis is on the recovery programming itself. Um, so we were looking at that. We're not just looking at the structure of the house and, and is it safe? And while we are doing that, we're also looking at what kind of programming are you providing? Um, and the reason that that's important is, is not only to keep people safe and make sure that they're getting some kind of quality, but that we want to be able to start looking at um, how is this working? You know, what are our outcomes? And in the recovery world, long-term outcome studies just have not been done. Um, so our outcomes have been, you know, two years really is the extent of recovery residence outcomes research um, that shows they um, decrease in treatment and post-treatment relapse rates and increase recovery, um, recovery outcomes like the, the ones I was talking about earlier, physical, mental, spiritual, social health. Um, but we really want to create a framework. Um, for, for looking at those things. Um, so our organization is certifying um, the, the recovery residences here in West Virginia uh, based on this national model that's been established. Um, I think that I think that about sums it up. I, I'll probably just stop there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Dr. Husted, could you tell me about your program, please? Certainly. So I'm Dr. Jeremy Husted. I work as an assistant professor at WVU Medicine in Morgantown. So I run the inpatient adult dual diagnosis unit. So um, Emily was speaking about uh, recovery houses, which are a wonderful tool that we try to employ. Um, my level of care is generally the most acute people. 
So the sickest of the sick. So people that just survived an opioid overdose and they're, um, they're in the throes of withdrawal and they come to my treatment or someone who's dying of alcoholism and we get them stabilized, make sure that nothing horrible happens to them. Um, folks that are um, using so much meth that they're seeing and hearing things and you know they're paranoid, they're, their family is not their family anymore. Um, folks that have been abusing cannabis for so long that now they, they, they can't stand to eat food or they're psychotic because of it. So kind of the worst of the worst cases um, is really the main thing that I work on um, here. At WVU, we have a lot of different programs though. So we're, it's not the only treatment we have. So the DDU that I'm on is the highest level, but then we have other things like the acute detox unit, which handles a little bit more straightforward, like opioid detoxes or meth detoxes. And then now we also have 28 day programs. Um, as Emily mentioned, you know, historically what we would do is only detox people. And then we'd send them on their merry way and say, you know, you're cured of addiction after seven days. Um, and of course, 99% of people would relapse because it's not really treatment. Um, in the ACM levels of care, they don't even, they don't even consider detox alone to be treatment because it truly isn't. So um, what we try to do is stabilize people on typically on medicines, but not always medicines. If they can go to a 28 day program and they need it, we arrange that, but that also is not the extent of, of care. So 28 days by itself does not cure anybody of addiction. 90 days doesn't cure anybody. Going to a program for a year doesn't cure anybody. It's a good groundwork for recovery, but it's not the end all be all. So what we try to do is connect people with whatever recovery community they can be in. So say they would do the DDU with me, get them stable, bring them back from the brink of death half the time, and then move them on to like a 28 day program. And then after 28 day, go to one of these, these recovery houses, which we love working with them and really try to get them in recovery. If they're on medicine, we keep them on medicine. We make sure they're following a doctor often, making sure they're doing okay. Um, besides the addiction standpoint, a lot of folks, when they're actively using, they're not thinking a whole lot about their other health problems. And the reality is we deal with a lot of other health problems, especially hepatitis C is so common. Um, besides leading the country in overdoses, we also lead the country in hepatitis C. So trying to treat that is, is, is something we, we work on, making sure people are stable. Um, we also work on endocarditis. So for those who don't know, injecting drugs uh, puts you at very high risk for infections of your heart lining. So at Ruby, we have an entire wing of the hospital dedicated to, to treating folks, who are typically very sick, um, often need surgery, need to be in the hospital for typically two months at a time just to get stable. And so we treat them there, but we also, again, start them on medicine, try to get them into 28 day programs or get them into a recovery house. So try to be as holistic as we possibly can be. So um, lots of different treatments, stigma. Stigma is such a big thing we try to overcome because that really interferes with every level of care. It prevents people from going into treatment, prevents people from getting on the right treatment, keeps people away from long-term programs. Um, so dealing with that, that's, that's kind of our biggest enemy is stigma. And of course, always fighting through the insurance um, unfortunately, we, we live in a country that insurance is such a problem and uh, this stuff can be very expensive. So even, even wealthy folks, uh, it's very hard to afford this stuff. So without insurance, it, it makes things very difficult. Even with the recovery houses, there's still a cost to most of them. Um, so no income, it, it, it makes things very difficult. So trying to navigate all those systems and have, having people that work with you that can really help uh, get people the resources that they need is what, what we try to do. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Husted. Um, next, we will have Deborah Davis, please. Would you please tell us about your program? Absolutely, good morning. Um, first, I'd like to thank Sarah and Brittany and Brandon and everyone that's been involved in this to give One Voice a platform like this. We're, uh, we're pretty pumped about that. Um, Brandon mentioned yesterday, compassion fatigue. And I can tell you, I had through the last 15 years, I can speak about that personally. And he also talked about uh, proximate leadership. And I can tell you that this platform has created that for me. So I'm thankful. Um, it's, um, it's a very meaningful way to bring everybody together. I want to give you a little bit of background because One Voice is truly pioneers in our area in Wyoming County. We've been around for 15 years. And um, 
We were established as a nonprofit in 2012. Our board spans uh, six counties and um, we have two in Tennessee. So um, we have 22,420 volunteer hours for 2019. So our volunteers are dedicated. Uh, they're faithful, they're passionate uh, for people and programs. Um, so we have no paid staff to date. So for the last 15 years, uh, we do things because um, we want our communities to be healthy. Um, and we haven't seen that. I live in Oceana, which is Deb Oceana. We have the documentaries to prove it. And um, we are hopeful that that's changing. Uh, we have a pulse on Southern West Virginia also. Um, being in all the communities where the boots on the ground and um, we see the faces, we hear the stories. Uh, it's not just um, done in paper or cubicles or offices in another state. We are in the community every day. It's not an event, it's, um, it's a marathon. Uh, in 2017, though, the governor chose Wyoming County to create a statement of work for the opioid response plan, uh, which I chair. And um, with this funding, one voice began to grow our vision of rescuing, rebuilding, and restoring families to grow healthy communities. Uh, we acquired a 7,000 square foot hardware building, which I'm sitting in today. Um, we um, spent the last year renovating it. And uh, we want to become a triage to ensure care and resources and training that will be available and delivered on site at One Boys with our strategic partners. Um, we have opened a, a coffee shop called One Cup Coffee with a Mission. Uh, we have a state of the art conference room um, that will train and educate the community. We have designated office spaces um, to implement wraparound services with our strategic partners. Our faith-based community, um, we are organized throughout the community with uh, local churches. They, um, they're engaged through, of course, monetary donations, but they also donate our food for our Food for Angel program where we serve over 1,300 kids uh, in all of our schools. Um, and we've been doing that since 2012. Um, they pack and they deliver these um, 1,300 bags of food uh, during the course of the time because um, we found out really early that anyone choosing to recover also has a family that's been involved in it, that has an employer or a school or, or, or. So we also um, involve them in guest speaking. We're invited to come and, you know, share what we do with them and how they can help because um, the faith-based community and the local churches, uh, a lot of them don't, uh, don't know what to do. And if you can give them a list of things to do, uh, they're usually pretty good about saying, you know, whatever we can do. In fact, the little church across the street, they learned about our Food for Angel program recently. And as a couple ministry, they would come over on Monday mornings as couples in their church and they pack our bags for us. So that was a big blessing for us. Um, we also, in August, we knew that as we became closer to opening in their community, that we wanted the pastors to know first what we were doing and why we were doing it and how we wanted them to involve. So we did a cast, casting vision with our pastors. Um, our community is engaged um, every day. We don't just show up at an event and expect everything to just fall into place because it's daily. Uh, just like uh, Emily and Jeremy spoke before, um, you can't just say, well, you can come back in three weeks and you can get whatever you need. They may or may not even be alive at that time. So uh, being genuine through the years has caused um, credibility for one voice that uh, we are non-judgmental. Everybody's got issues. Everybody's got a mess. It just looks different. Um, sometimes theirs is called addiction. Um, we like sitting across the, you know, the table. We like seeing the face-to-face -face stories. Uh, we want them to see our hearts, not just um, uh, words, lip service, which um, they're used to a lot. And um, we make it real. Ask Senator Manchin. Uh, you can Google uh, Oceana Middle School and Senator Manchin, and 
You can read wonderful press releases and Senate floor discussions. Uh, it really makes a difference. Our three biggest challenges are transportation, communication, and funding. However, we do have solutions. Um, we decided transportation was an issue in Wyoming County and anyone that's traveled in Wyoming County, it's a circular thing. We don't have streets and there's no shortcut to anything. You have to start in one part of the county and you have to go all the way around to get back to it. That's just how it works. Uh, so we decided we'll just be on Main Street. We're not gonna be in any of the outer line areas. We're just gonna be on Main Street and they can walk to us if they need to. Uh, communication was, we decided to do the conference center, uh, have state-of-the-art technology. We can do Zoom. We can do large support groups across the state or nation. Uh, that way, if they, uh, they don't have the internet service or they don't have uh, the laptops or whatever, they can come here. And funding, of course, we're always seeking grants. Uh, th this conference is a, a huge and a wonderful way to network, and we're thankful for that. Um, opportunities for 2021. Moving forward, we are very excited about uh, the replication of our vision. We, uh, the pack and go projects that uh, this is going to be our Southern regional office and we are hoping to acquire two uh, more regional offices, one in the central part of the state and one in the Northern part of the state and this be the pilot program. Um, we, um, we also want to have this uh, community resource building to be a hub. We want it to be a place to gather and to gather safely and to become an employer. Um, partnerships uh, like this has been amazing. Uh, a lot of you I didn't know four years ago and I'm thankful I can look across and, and share stories now share partnerships now, and I'm thankful for that. So um, funding sources is, uh, is gonna be a, a major thing for us in, in our partnerships. So we want One Voice to be utilized as a community resource to fight the stigma, grow the recovery community, and celebrate a happy, healthy, and whole community. And one of the ways that we, um, it's a quick story, but one of the ways that we fought stigma was when we first started our renovation building, we asked Day Report to come over and they brought nine participants and uh, they dropped them off. We had a lot to do. We, this was a hardware building. It had a lot of leftover inventory. So we asked the community to come and we worked for four hours. Um, it was nonstop. We sat down, we had pizza together, fellowshiped a little bit together, and then we just began to talk just to build that relationship, which you have to spend the time to do. At two o'clock, they report, had to report back. They got on the van and they left. The community was left sitting like, who are those people? You know, they worked more in four hours that we could have got accomplished in four days, uh, maybe four weeks. Um, and that's when you're, you're able to tell them that's, that's their day report, you know, participants and they're vital to our community. They are hard workers. You give them the opportunity they can do. So the another partnership before I leave, this is their Wyoming County toolkit that Terry and Dr. Mace was instrumental in helping us on. If your county has one, obtain it. We have provided ours in, um, uh, gosh, local businesses, local partners in our packets when we send them out. Uh, it has all of our resources countywide. It's a wealth of information and it's very nicely done. So Terry, we are very appreciative and thank you for that. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, I truly hope that we can come together as one voice and impact our community meaningfully. Well, thank you very much, Deborah. And by the way, we have now done toolkits for the entire state of West Virginia in six different regions. And if anyone's interested in anything, please contact me. I will be happy to send you some information on that. And last but not least, we have Ashley Shaw. And Ashley, if you would share some information about your program. Sure, thanks so much and good morning again to everyone. Uh, you know what, these, these uh, panelists have really summed it up and I don't really feel the need to say much more, but uh, to tell you a little bit about CORE, uh, again, my name is Ashley Shaw. I am CORE Director 
core is creating opportunities for recovery employment with Marshall Health. And um, CORE was really created uh, as really just another component to the continuum of care the individuals in recovery need. And I say that because, you know, sometimes folks um, in the past have kind of seen work as like the end all be all, like if you have to get a job and that's it, and that's going to fix all your problems. And that's just not the case. You know, employment and, and workforce development is really just a component to someone's recovery. And so CORE um, really works comprehensively um, as a liaison between um, participants and employers within the community to help link folks back to work um, within their communities. And so uh, we're all about building an infrastructure that supports a recovery ecosystem so that um, folks who are in their communities can really get back, you know, inside of a, a community to have community and really to support the communities that they live in. And so um, CORE spans across a 12 county region. Uh, uh, those 12 counties are broken down into hubs. And, I, and I'll say this just because I don't know who all is on um, this platform today, but I want to just allow people the opportunity to kind of know where CORE exists in the event your community or some or your organization would like to connect with us. So our 12 counties um, are broken down into what we call hubs. And so hub one serves Cabell, Wayne and Lincoln counties. Hub two is Kanawha, Boone, Logan and Mingo County. And then hub three is Fayette, Raleigh, Wyoming, Mercer and McDowell. And we ex we're so excited because we are currently expanding to hub three as we speak. And we're gonna be right in that coffee shop with Deb Davis pretty soon. And I'm really excited about it. I want COVID to go away so I can like come and just get me a cup of coffee to be honest with you, Deb. So um, that just kind of tells you what regions we serve currently. Um, our process is all about focusing on the individual. So we have basically a four component model that we focus on. That is participant engagement, employer engagement. Um, it deals with building resources within the community and then social enterprise development. And so as we talk about the participant, we have a comprehensive assessment, intake assessment that every participant takes once they uh, enroll in CORE. And we take a look at everything, you know, their previous employment experience, their skill sets, their education, barriers to employment, um, their medical history, history, dental history, like all of those things, we take a look at that. And some people say, well, why do you even ask about like their hygiene and their, um, you know, have you, when's the last time you've seen the doctor and when's the last time you've had a dentist appointment? Well, we ask about those things because all of those things impact employment. And so if you're not feeling confident about your smile, it's going to impact the way you project yourself when you're on an interview and in, and in the workforce. We've had individuals who didn't feel confident about their smile and they wouldn't even engage in an interview just because that was a barrier to employment. And so we're all about reducing any barrier to employment. And so we work specifically through that intake assessment to identify what are the strengths of that individual, where are some areas of opportunity, and how do we navigate this process with them to help champion their success in the future. And so the second component is employer engagement. You know, it does no good for CORE to sort of, you know, wave a banner that we're all here helping to get people jobs if we don't connect with employers. So a part of our job is really connecting, getting in the community to learn about employers who are willing to offer that recovery supportive environment. And then if we have employers who are not, sometimes let's just be honest, some employers, you know, they it's, it's a little bit terrifying to kind of open up your door in that way. And that's okay. It's about having those conversations to see how we can sort of push the dial along. How can we move you from a no to a maybe to a yes? How do we do that and offer that ongoing support as individuals are hired in recovery to employers to say, okay, what, are, what problems are you having? How can we work to kind of mitigate those issues as they arise with individuals in recovery? The other a portion of that is really community resources. I mean, we have partners everywhere, which is the wonderful thing about CORE is that we really try to focus on 
having a solution to every sort of barrier that can present itself. You know, one of our greatest partners that we have is really Jobs and Hope. Uh, we've sort of started trailblazing at the same time and they've been a, an awesome partner to have because we really work together, our staff work together to really sort of support our initiatives together. Um, our partners like One Voice. I mean, I could go on and on about partners, but we really work within the community to sort of establish where are the holes who can fill that hole so that that way, if we have a participant who has a need, we can direct them in that in that area. And then the other piece of that is just social enterprise. Um, we understand that there are just some individuals just because of their colored past and things that have happened that it's really difficult for them to gain competitive employment. And so we want to offer opportunities to really start businesses that really employ, specifically employ individuals um, who are in recovery. So CORE is working on a number of, of projects as it relates to social enterprise development and really, really getting people back working within the communities. Now, Ashley, I know you're putting out a toolkit that works with the employers and it comes out in January. That is the goal. Yes. So I, we just got off the call with the chamber yesterday. Uh, we're working with the West Virginia State Chamber. Uh, we are coordinating efforts to try to get that done uh, in January, completed, and, and it will be accessible to all employers across the state. So uh, we're really excited about that. And that toolkit will really give employers an opportunity to really educate themselves from what is addiction? What does that look like? Why, you know, why do we consider it a disease? And really, how can I hire and retain individuals who are in recovery? That sounds great. I'm looking forward to talking to you more about that as we discussed earlier. So, okay, now let's go back to Emily. And if Emily would tell me a little bit more about the stable housing impact on recovery. Um, so, you know, a person, you know, like I said earlier, um, in order to, to keep people, we're trying to keep people in recovery. We're not just trying to get them sober and stable housing is a really important part of that. Um, so one of the things that, you know, we see is a lot of people have it, like people come into recovery from all different walks of life, you know, but many of them do not have stable housing. Um, so depending on the person and their history of use, um, and, and it's, it's just a really important aspect, you know, but, but what we're doing is not just housing, it's also recovery. Um, so when we're talking about recovery housing, it's both. It's this programmatic element and it's housing. So we're sort of at this intersection of the two. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're integrating that element of peer support that I talked about earlier. And then, of course, you know, some, some aspect of drug testing. But as you go up the levels of care, the services change. So it really depends on, on the person and where they're at. Um, so not to get too far into it, but for example, our lowest level of care is what most people would call an Oxford house. And as I mentioned earlier, um, at that point, people are living in a house together. It's democratically run, meaning that people are making their, um, the, the group is working together to make the decisions without any um, house manager or CEO or anybody like that telling them what to do or how to be. Uh, but there is, there is a structure, Oxford House does have a structure that's implemented across the, across the country in the same way. Um, and then up to a level four, um, where you do have, you know, CEO, you have staff, you have house managers, you have uh, volunteers, clinical people, peer support workers, it can look any, any number of ways. Um, so depending on the person um, is really going to depend on, on where they go. Um, so the highest level of care is for somebody coming out of, uh, of um, one of the acute, the acute programs or, or somebody coming directly off the street. You know, Recovery Point is unique in that they actually have a social detox. So you wouldn't have to necessarily go to treatment first, but a lot of our programs do require some kind of um, either period of sobriety, um, which could be anywhere from three to um, you know, five, 10 days, it depends on the house. Um, some do require that you've been to a 28-day program per first. So it really depends on the person. There's just not a cookie cutter model. 
uh, for any of this at all at any point in time. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. So it really depends on the person. And when we're, we're looking at where they fit, um, we really want to look at, um, you know, what we call their recovery capital, which is, do they have a history of sobriety? Do they have a strong support network? Do they have internal motivation to recover? Do they have, um, it, you know, it can be any number of supportive factors. Um, and, and we're looking at, you know, where they're at in the process. So I know like Ashley was talking about working with employers to, to help them see like, what are the challenges? What are the barriers? How can we get them along this line of, of agreeing to, to, or being committed to doing a certain thing. Um, and we're working with people in the same way at that point. And we're really trying to meet them where they're at. And that's where our different levels of care come in. So it really depends on the person. Um, you know, like I said, our lowest level of care, there's not a lot of oversight. So ideally at that point in time, that person would have high recovery capital. So maybe they've been sober for six, seven, eight months, and maybe they do go to meetings and they have a sponsor and they're working steps and they really just need that extra little bit of support by living with people in recovery um, in order to, to maintain the path that they're on. Because we're talking about a long-term commitment here. Um, so that's a really helpful thing to have. Um, and then the, the level two, um, you're talking about like a house manager um, and, and it's, it's uh, what we call monitored. There's a house manager and then people living in the house. And that's really probably the bulk of the houses that we have in West Virginia. Um, and then a level three, which is staff with then oversight. Um, and those people are more likely to have structured programming. A recovery point is a level three. Um, where every hour of their day is accounted for. Every single hour they are engaged in activities, they're being signed off on. There's tons of other people in their program working with them, holding them accountable, being there to support them. Um, and then a level four is actually more, more clinically based um, in most places. So again, it really depends on the person. Um, and that's part of what Part of what we've been we've been trying to to do is that um, one thing that we noticed when we started was that there really wasn't a comprehensive view of recovery housing in West Virginia at all. Um, that the best resource guides came from these scrappy peer recovery groups um, scattered throughout the state. Um, I I was a peer recovery person. I had a pretty good list, um, but they weren't all put together in a comprehensive way. Um, so we actually started a capacity scan um, at the tail end of 2018 and, and through 2019 and wrapped it up earlier this year. Um, and, and essentially what we did was we put all of this stuff together and then we did outreach to try to fill in all the gaps. For some of the houses, all we had was a, a name and a phone number. Um, and others, we had like a full scale, this is what you can wear, this is what you cannot wear. Um, you know, this is when you pay in just full descriptions. Um, so we've really tried to fill in those gaps to help understand what the capacity of recovery housing in West Virginia is, meaning where do they fall in these levels, levels of care, who are they serving, what are they offering, um, and, and how can we make that available to people um, that need those services. So we have shared that data with the West Virginia Office of Drug Control Policy. You can find a locator on their Get Help tab. Um, on the, the West Virginia Office of Drug Control Policy website. We also have a locator on our website, which is wvarr.org. Um, we are working to add um, the component. Um, we, we have surveyed people about many different things, including whether or not they accept medication-assisted treatment and which forms they accept if they do. Um, and we'll be adding those on to our locator so that it'll be easier to find by, by criteria. Um, so when you, when you talk about um, the different styles of housing, it really ideally, we would like to see it um, more fit to the person where I think historically, um, just because of the need, you know, when you're in an emergency situation, somebody needs to go right now. Um, the way that we do that is we call a list of numbers until somebody says, yes, they can come. 
Um, that's just that's just being honest. Um, and then, of course, um, as the doctor mentioned earlier, do they have insurance if they need to go there? Um, all of all of these barriers start coming up, and so we really want to start looking at how can we make all of this stuff as available and easy to find, so that when people need it, it's there, um, and it's available for them right there when they need it. Um, I think that I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, well, thank you, Emily. And we'll go back to Dr. Husted. What role does medical providers play in creating and sustaining a recovery-friendly community? I think we, we can play a huge role. Um, you know, uh, as, uh, as Emily mentioned about, you know, medicines can be a part of it. Um, so if somebody is in recovery and they're on appropriate medicines, you know, that's obviously a big role that we play in making sure. Um, folks that, again, that are getting better, um, it's not like all the other things suddenly go away. You know, you still need your, your mammograms if you're a lady or your pap smears or, you know, get, just getting things generally taken care of. Um, because a lot of times when folks are in active use, you're not, you're not thinking about any of those things. I mean, we all, I mean, we're not immune to health problems ourselves. So I think it can be a huge role because really health is, is more than just, uh, like you said, sobriety. Sobriety by itself is great. Um, it kind of starts with sobriety, but if you don't have all the other things, you know, you can be sober, but still, um, still have bad kidneys, or you can be sober and you're dying of hepatitis C that's untreated. Um, so I, I think we can play a huge role. And the reality is, folks, once they start feeling better physically, uh, they'll feel better mentally and kind of vice versa, too. So, you, you know, which, what you see is historically you try to tease out you know, this is mental illness, or this is addiction, or this is physical illness. Um, the reality is it, it's all, it's intertwined. Um, so physically, you're not feeling well, your mood is going to go down. If you're physically feeling terrible, you're going to want to keep using. And so we play a role in trying to help that, you know, there, there's definitely good treatments available, um, really, especially for opioid use. So it, it is gold, the gold standard within medicine is to treat. So historically, it really came down to, did a doctor want to? Did a patient want to? Was the recovery setting even accepting of it for them to, to choose treatment or not? The reality is from a medical standpoint, the evidence all points for at least for opioids is to use medicine. There's different ones, they have all of the pros, they have all the cons, but it's to use medicine appropriately. Um, so that's where we can play a role. And the fact that recovery places are opening up and allowing people to be on medicines appropriately is fantastic. Uh, historically, some places you weren't even allowed to be on aspirin to, and, and actually live at one of these places. So there's definitely been a uh, change at different levels, which is a good thing. Stigma is still such a barrier, but as doctors, you know, taking care of the patients individually I know a large role that I play is just working with other doctors who don't understand addiction or don't want to understand addiction. You know, they, they kind of try to ignore it until unfortunately they suffer from it or someone in their family suffers from it, but um, try to advocate for good treatment, advocate for our patients. You know, I, one thing that I did a few weeks ago is one of my patients, um, she's working with CPS, unfortunately. And, and, you know, just talking to them saying, Hey, she's doing everything in the world that I could ask her for. She, she's earned the right to have her kids back. The fact that she's on medicine or doing this, that shouldn't keep her away from her kids. So we can play a huge role. We, we definitely have a voice um, and hopefully it's, it's for the better of folks and, and get them into the places they need to be. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah, how does having a community center focused on community impact a community and the role of the faith-based? You are on mute. Let me speak to, sorry, let me speak to uh, when we first began in 2005, the local churches said there was no addiction and there was no addiction, on, you know, sitting on their pews. Um, and now I can tell you that we have pastors that come in with questions. We have pastors come in with wanting to know what kind of programs that they can have. They also come in with advice now. So, um, I had spoke to most of that about um, when, when I spoke earlier, but uh, that has been the biggest change with the, the faith-based community recently. 
So do you have a group of your faith base that get together on a monthly basis or something that you're able to talk to all of them at one time? Well, we have we have three different counties that have support groups right now. Um, we have one in Greenbrier County. We have one in Raleigh County and Greenbrier County is working on it. We haven't been able to do anything much in Wyoming County because we've spent our time and focus on the renovation. However, uh, it hasn't stopped our services. Uh, we still do intakes. We still do crisis referrals. Um, we have, um, the COVID really just needs to go. We've had, we've had a lot of overdoses um, in, in Wyoming County and it just really needs to go. Yeah, COVID has changed quite a few things, hasn't it? It has. Well, Ashley, I want to hear some of your success stories. I know you've got some success <laughs> stories that I want to hear about. Sure. Um, I'll start with um, one that in particular that really stands out to me. Um, one of our employment specialists um, that had been working with an individual had labeled himself, had really, uh, you know, come into one of the meetings and said, you know, I'm the bad boy of recovery. That's that's what he had said about himself. I'm the bad boy of recovery. And, you know, she inquired as to, you know, why why would you say that? And, and he goes on to say, you know, I have multiple, multiple felonies. You know, I've been convicted of robbery and just larceny and all just all sorts of things. He had multiple felonies. In addition to that, you know, in his words, I've, I've had multiple failed attempts at treatment. And we know that treatment is just an ongoing thing, right? Treatment and recovery is ongoing. But in his words, I've had multiple failed attempts at recovery. Um, and so he really just felt a sense of hopelessness as it related to finding employment. He had tried to find employment and had really just given up on the, uh, the option that there ever being an opportunity and where he may be able to get back to work. He wanted to go back to college. He didn't know where to start. And so after he started engaging with our services, um, we did an intake assessment, worked on setting up a job development plan. You know, we started working on just his um, his resume and, you know, getting a cover letter set up. And one of the empl employment specialists conducted a mock interview with him just so he could sort of uh, work on his interviewing tips and skills and things of that nature. And so after that, not only did he get one job offer, he got two job offers. And so we were thrilled because, and, and, and I say that because, and we're not talking about minimum, a minimum wage position. This gentleman was offered at one location, $12 an hour. And so for someone who has had multiple failed attempts, for someone who has said, I am the bad boy of recovery, for someone who says, there is not an option for me. This is this is what I'm going to be stuck to living. To be able to give this individual an opportunity to connect back into the workforce was amazing. Um, and so we're happy to report that he started at Marshall uh, and he is employed. And so for us, that's a success. Um, I'll give you one other one that's more recent and that we shared on one of our uh, recent regional advisory council meetings. You know, part of what we do is working with uh, employers. And so one of our employment specialists um, in the Hub 2 re region uh, sort of uh, noticed that there was one employer who was posting all of these positions on their website and all of them required for the, you know, applicants to have a driver's license. And so she started kind of asking herself, do all of these, after she's looking like, do all of these jobs really require a driver's license? And so she started a conversation. She reached out to that employer and said, hey, I want to talk to you. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do, but I have a question. And so her question was, do all of these jobs really require a driver's license? And so that really sort of started that employer to have that conversation internally to say, you know what, some of these jobs we don't really need to have a driver's license for these. And so as a result of that type of conversation, she was able to sort of vet a participant that we had that she thought would be a good fit for one of those positions. And so that employer changed their hiring practices, number one. And then as a result of that, we were able to sort of match an individual to employment 
not only did that person get employment, but that person has also applied for an additional position within that employer. And they're really talking about hiring him for that other uh, position, just because he's proven over the course of time that he can work just as hard. He's just as committed as anyone else is to the process of working and giving back to the community. It makes the effort so much better when you have people in recovery doing positive things to show others. Exactly. Well, I think at this point we need to move to Susie with chat to see if there are any questions that she has. Um, and we'll get as many answers as we can in the uh, next few minutes. And if we need more time, we can go into additional questions. Thanks, Terry. So one of the questions is about limited and no income. Uh, being a challenge for people that need recovery housing. Um, so are there any funds available um, for people, Emily, that you are aware of that uh, help cover some of those costs? No, there are not. Um, this is actually something that we have been talking about internally. Um, we, we did try to apply for some, um, and unfortunately we're not successful, but this is a major major need. Um, we have seen other states that have earmarked funds in their legislature or have gotten funds um, directly from their state department. It, it really depends on the state and the structure and, and, and the way that they go about that. Um, but it's a significant need because like what I was saying earlier, a lot of people that are going into recovery housing um, say, for example, they were lucky enough to, to go to a 28-day program. Um, you know, they weren't working while they were in that 28-day program. They probably didn't have employment before. They probably didn't have stable housing before that. Um, and so how are these people paying? Like when you, so just to, just to clarify, so recovery housing um, is not funded by insurance. Um, there has been, has been a, a shift more recently where the peer support services that are offered in these houses um, may become, may be billable services depending on the way that the program is operating in the structure. So if they're working um, in conjunction with um, or even becoming a licensed behavioral health center, then they are able to bill Medicaid um, and other insurance companies for those those peer recovery support services that are offered on site with limit. Um, but most of our, our programs um, are self-pay. So less than 50% get any kind of funding from the state, less than 20% get any kind of funding from, from federal agencies. So that means they are, are sustaining their operation from resident fees. Um, so keeping in mind that those fees do not just, we don't call them rent. It's not just rent. It's also, it's a program fee. And it, it pays for the, the staff that are working there. It sometimes pays for the food in the refrigerator. It sometimes pays for the services that they're offering. Again, it really depends on, on the program and the model and, and how it's structured, which varies really from house to house. Um, but the reality is that the burden is on these residents. So depending on where the person goes, and again, this is why it's so important that we start looking at not, we start understanding that not all of these houses are equal. That 28 day program and a, and a recovery house are not equal. They are not the same. They're both important, but they are not the same. And, and the same thing goes with recovery housing. Not all of recovery housing is the same. It really depends on the person. So a person who is just coming out of a 28 day program you know, overdose five or six times in the six months prior has a really long history of, of use and, and challenges would not be a good fit for an Oxford house because they are not ready for that level of accountability where they're not going to meetings. There's not that added support. Um, they're, they're just going straight to work because they're having to pay for all of their bills to, you know, to maintain that house. Um, so I would really like to see, um, when we're talking about needs and, and 2021 goals, um, I know that, that my assistant director, Jenny, is on here. She and I have really been looking at this and having this conversation where we'd really like to see some kind of fund that covers at least the first month's rent 
for people who are either coming out of jail or prison, people coming out of treatment, people who were homeless or indigent. Um, it's a serious need. Um, some, I, I will say that some of our programs, um, for example, Recovery Point. Recovery Point is free to the participant um, for a certain amount of time, which makes it a really unique and special service in this state. Um, so we do have them all over the state. We have RPC here in Charleston, which is our women's facility. Um, the rest of them are men's facilities. Um, but, the, but all the other ones are, are resident pay. Um, and so we do have some that have scholarships. So I would really encourage anybody who's working as a peer support worker um, or anybody that is, you know, social work, working with people to get them into housing, always, always ask. You know, is there a scholarship program? Do you have consideration? The worst thing they can do is tell you no. But if you don't ask, you're not going to know. Um, and, and so I think that's important. We also have programs that have incentives. Um, I know like West Virginia Sober Living has, has a, a discount incentive for people to continue to participate um, in, their, in their treatment programming. So you get a discount if you continue to see your therapist, if you continue on, on whatever medication program you're on, if you're continuing in your IOP services. Um, so it really varies from, from program to program how they do that. Um, but the short answer to your question is that we need that. We need to have that kind of funding available. Um, where it comes from, I, I do not have the answer to that yet. Um, but it is something that is, is very needed. Thanks, Emily. Um, so there is another question uh, about, let me scroll back up here. So we have um, somebody who is looking as a goal to open a long-term program in the form of a recovery farm. And there, there is a model for that in West Virginia, but it has been um, privately funded and it is it, it is very costly. Um, Jacob's Ladder, which was uh, featured in the film Recovery Boys, uh, it's a very different program than what was portrayed in the film, which is several years old now. Um, and, and, you know, it's costly. And, you know, the, the only reason that that program is able to exist is because the founder, Dr. Kevin Blankenship, has, you know, invested huge amounts of, of his personal um, funds and, you know, is completely committed to, you know, the staff and the residents and, you know, they've opened a sober living as well. Um, so it's, it's a very, that's a very challenging thing to open. I previously was the program director there, so I have a lot of firsthand um, experience with the with the challenges of that um, not to be discouraging but you know it's it's very costly um, and so the question is the community that uh, the person is in doesn't have any uh, real examples of uh, recovery housing programs and uh, challenges around stigma and misinformation about what recovery programs are and aren't. So do any of the panelists have suggestions for this participant as to um, where would be a good place to start uh, to get that conversation going? Uh, and maybe Deborah, it's a good question for you having had that experience in Wyoming County for a number of years. Well, I learned early on that um, you can't wait until you know everything. You can't wait until you have everything on a list. Uh, you just have to go. You have to um, know in your heart what you want to do, and you have to be able to sacrifice the time to do it. Um, and people just come up, I mean, truly divine appointments. Doors have opened for us that um, only God could do. We, can, we cannot go uh, any further than if we just sit at the table and talk about it. Um, you there are so many times I've been out of my comfort zone, today being one of them, and um, you just, the door opens and you sit down and you share and you talk. And then someone's heart, um, someone that you, I mean, just a sentence or two, and you start a conversation and then it starts to go. Uh, if you would have told me in 2005 that I would be sitting in a building that had been a hardware store all my life, 
that I've lived in Wyoming County, that uh, one voice would own it outright, that we would have the renovations done on it, that the doors were getting ready to open, that we could bring people in recovery in to hire, to train, to re just remove the stigma from, from bother with us anyway, so that they can at least know what that feels like and then enter a community. I wouldn't have believed it. I didn't see it on the radar. So you just don't give up. And Deborah, it's really, you know, the cliche, it's a marathon, not a sprint, couldn't be more true in terms of, of changing community attitudes, you know, broad community attitudes. But, you know, I think that one of the things that you all did in Wyoming County was to, you know, convene and give people the, the platform and the opportunity to come together and have the difficult discussions. And, you know, it's, it's shifted uh, in the last few years, what appears to be quickly. However, you know, what people don't see, it's kind of like a tree. You see the, the tree bloom and you see uh, fruit come on, but what you didn't see was all the years that it took the, root, the, the tree's root system to get established in order to support um, that growth. And, and so, you know, it's really challenging when, you know, we're in the middle of a, a, an epidemic overlay with a pandemic and the urgency of, you know, the loss of life and the increase in the loss of life that we've seen in the last eight months. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a real challenge, but, you know, I think you also, um, for our attendees, surround yourself with like-minded people, surround yourself with other people to, that have done it, um, perhaps maybe connect with somebody who has, has made some progress and get some mentorship and, and uh, kind of draft off of their sales a little bit to keep yourself motivated because it's, it's a challenge to, to stay in that marathon. It is. I was going to say that stigma is being addressed at a state level too. So there, I'm part of a committee, pretty big committee that we're working on ways to try to address it in the state. Certain places like uh, Lewisburg School of Osteopathic Medicine has done a lot. Marshall, I know, has done some. We've set, uh, also done our part here, but it's really trying to coordinate all the efforts. Uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to education, again, about what recovery looks like, what sobriety is, what medicines are for, what's available, all those things. So it, it's definitely being worked on. You know, there's different levels of stigma. So the, you know, the base le level is people themselves are very stigmatized. So when you're actively using, you look at yourself a lot differently. I'm sure anybody who's, who's struggled with it can agree with that. Um, so kind of overcoming that at just the individual patient level, something like Deborah sounds like she's doing, and then moving up to doctors and politicians and law enforcement is really one of the hardest ones to reach out to. We're, we're also doing a judiciary thing right now where we work with judges throughout the state and just teaching them about addiction treatment, how we do it, why we do it, trying to teach them because they're at a loss. You don't go to law school and think about addiction training and, and actually it's kind of unfortunate but a lot of um a lot of medical students a lot of nursing students really any student they have no idea about about how to treat this stuff um and in law enforcement the training that they get is all negative against any kind of treatment so it's all about jail 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 and that's um that's something that really does need to change and we're working on it. I was gonna say too about like in terms of um, getting people treatment they need and insurance, no or little income is actually not a bad thing because you know, thankfully we do have a very good Medicaid program in the state. So as long as people have proof of income and they get signed up for it, that opens the door to a lot of things. Maybe not some of the recovery houses because you, you just need cold hard cash for that kind of stuff. But in terms of treatment, just getting insurance is not really hard if they're not working. Um, and often we do that when people are in the hospital, we start the process. Sometimes our, they, it gets activated while they're here. So they can walk out of here, no insurance, almost dead. They walk out of here with insurance, with medicine, with the right treatment. And that's really the, the goal for everybody. So, I just wanted to add, because um, I know the person's question was was directly about recovery housing. Um, I'll put my email in the chat and you can shoot me an email. Um, we have a lot of resources um, for those NIMBY issues, um, specifically surrounding 
recovery housing. And, and I can say also um, that, that one of the, the things that um, Devin and Susie were saying is, is about giving people a, a, a place to talk about what their concerns are um, and addressing those directly because a lot of people just don't understand um, or, or they've had bad experiences or whatever, but they have some kind of perception in their mind about what these things are. And, and like recently here in Charleston, um, there was this whole, um, you know, it was this whole big deal because there was a program opening up in a residential neighborhood, which is where recovery houses tend to go. Um, and, and it kept being called a treatment program. This treatment program is opening up in a residential neighborhood. And this is where language is everything. Um, because when you talk about treatment, you could be talking about like detox, you could be talking about outpatient, you could be talking about all of these different things. But what I think they were actually talking about was a sober living house. And because they don't know that, you know, there's all of this misconception about what it is and what it's going to be. And of course, people would much rather have people still using drugs and alcohol next door than people who are trying to not use drugs and alcohol next door. Um, but they really just don't understand. Um, and I can say as a person in recovery, I have a program that teaches me to model by model my transformation and lead by example. And I think one of the things that, that we can do better is to, to emphasize those stories of people who have and do recover um, and to share those stories with those people and, and show them. So maybe if you know a few people that have been through a recovery house or, or people who are in recovery. Um, I know that I've, I've been to a meeting um, here in Charleston on, on, the, on the west side. Um, there was somebody who was looking to open a program and asked me if I would come to the community meeting. And the, the, they were looking to put a home in a, in a church um, that had been completely untouched and unused for over 10 years. Nothing was happening in that church. And the parishioners were up in arms about thinking that it might become a recovery home. So the person asked me, would I come and talk to them about what recovery residences are, what they're not. Um, and when I got there and I told them I was a person in recovery, none of them could believe it because I'm an educated young woman with a, a title. I'm an executive director. And that is not the picture of recovery. That's not the picture of addiction that gets painted, but it's the reality of recovery. You know, it is real and there is an, another side of it. And I think sharing those stories and the, the efforts that Jeremy was talking about, um, that's one of the things that they're doing is really showing this different side um, where the focus has been so much on what's wrong, you know, what's the problem, but not so much on the solution. And the fact is that the solution is happening everywhere, all over the state, and all of the people on this panel are working in the solution. Um, so those would be my suggestions. Yeah, thank you, Emily, for that. And, you know, the other, there are programs that have been funded in the last few years and expanded, such as LEAD, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Programs. And so there are places, you know, not that every community yet has a LEAD program, but there are places in the state where, you know, those attitudes and, you know, misconceptions are being shifted through programs community-wide through LEAD, um, the drug courts and the new, you know, family uh, drug court, which if you attend this afternoon, you'll learn more about um, the collegiate recovery programs, um, the drug-free mothers and babies programs. I mean, there are lots and lots of um, efforts happening out there that a lot of people still don't know about. And, you know, so I really appreciate the fact that we've been able to dedicate so much of the program time today to talking about recovery and talking about these solutions um, it fits, you know, with the small communities, big solutions theme. So I uh, appreciate um, Sarah Payne Scarborough giving so much time of today's uh, agenda to focus on these solutions and the positive things that are happening around the state. We've got a long way to go uh, until, you know, every county has enough sober living facilities that, you know, are high quality, safe environments. Uh, we have a long way to go until every, co every college, you know, it becomes the norm for um, people to have recovery support as just a given. Um, 
we have you know, a long way to go until every community has a lead program, until every community, uh, you know, fortunately, one of the uh, highlights um, is jobs and hope. And every community does have somebody as a transition agent um, to help individuals with uh, re-entry and, and employment. So there are so many good things that have happened uh, in the state on a systemic level in you know the last five years it's it's pretty amazing things are definitely getting better now the last thing I'd like for you all to talk about is some opportunities that you have that for others that could maybe help you maybe there's someone out there that can help but they don't know how and so maybe someone can speak up or everyone can and let us know what opportunities you have for someone to reach out and work together Well, I'll jump in and, and just say for CORE, you know, I, I mentioned and alluded to, you know, we're really focused on social enterprise development. I think one thing that um, we probably need to take notice of and that we've probably all noticed is that, you know, people are really selling their entrepreneurial skills. And for us, that's a focus for the future because, you know, sometimes there just aren't the opportunities to match what the person needs. And I think there are a lot of participants who may have some um, entrepreneurial skills or ideas and things that they want to do to sort of develop their own business. And so if someone's out there and has interest in sort of pushing that a bit, I would be sort of interested in learning more about that and maybe ways that we can develop opportunities for participants as it relates to creating and starting their own businesses. That sounds great. Anyone else? Yes, I'd like to add, uh, we became a workforce host site and um, they send us participants. We also have um, a partnership with Community Action and we have um, a participant there now that um, uh, his name is James and he's watching and listening. So I just wanted to say hi to him. He's in Raleigh County and he's a really hard worker and we're very thankful to have him with us. Dr. Husted or Emily, anything to add? One thing I was going to say is, you know, um, Emily talked about it. Um, these when they're trying to start up these houses and and communities get so concerned because no, you don't want to bring addiction to my community. But the reality is, and I think somebody also mentioned about um, pastors saying it's not on my church pews, you know. But the reality is, it's there. It's always been there. You know, we've been blind to it or we ignored it or we pretended it wasn't there. If you look around, you're surrounded by folks that struggle or, or who are in recovery. Historically, they wouldn't talk about it much because they knew they'd be met by, you know, raised eyebrows at the very least, but often resistance. And that just goes to show how powerful addiction is and the stigma of it, that we know exactly what's going to help people. We know that they need housing, they need treatment, they need this, they need that, and yet we're still reluctant to do it. Or we'll say, not in my community, but maybe the town over, that's okay. So I think if, if you, uh, opportunities people have, whatever community you're in, you know, if there is a debate about something, you know, should we allow this, should we allow that? I think as long as it's a solid place and, they, and they're trying to do things right, there's no reason not to bring it in because the reality is, Addiction's already where you live, and um, it's there. It's just it's maybe unrecognized, or we pretended it's not there, but clearly, clearly, it's all around us. So the more treatment we can get, the less stigmatizing we can be, the better. And I'm, I mean, from from a medical perspective, the way I explain it is, this isn't a whole lot different than what we've dealt with with cancer. So a long time ago, people who had cancer, they didn't seek treatment, or if they had it, they hid it from everyone because they were scared to death the treatment or what people would say. But now if you have cancer, it's still difficult, but at least you know you can get help and usually it's pretty solid help. So that's kind of our hope with addiction treatment that if you have it, you'll seek help, that the community you're in is willing to embrace you and not push you away um, because they're already involved. And there are a lot of people, again, that are in recovery. I mean, it's not like doctors are immune from addiction or nurses or anybody. So the physicians help programs and, and Lord knows, you know, law enforcement, I mean, the rates of alcoholism are so high, uh, you know, prison guards, it's, it's 
there. It's always been there. So it's a question of, are we going to treat it or are we going to ignore it? So. And I thank you, know, you very much, Emily. That was a, I just want to say um, thank you, Dr. He said, because I, Susie, I don't know if you remember this, um, but a few years ago when I, I first um, got onto this recovery path, we went to a collegiate recovery conference in DC. And there was, um, I think, a state legislator or some, some senator or something that was speaking at the university. And he also compared um, the recovery movement to, to cancer. And he was saying 20 years ago, nobody talked about it. It was the C word. And now we wear ribbons and we have parades and look how it's celebrated. And that has always stuck with me. So I love that you said that um, because that just touched me a lot. Um, and also, you know, um, just like he was saying, my, my response when people say we don't want it in our community is that we do. We want it in your community because the reality is that addiction is in your community. Whether you want to acknowledge it or look at it or not, it's there. And if we want to make progress with that, if we want to start um, helping people get better, we want them to learn to live in your communities as a functional member of that community, um, you know, not send them out and, and whatever. And I think that's one of the places where we're, we're losing people is that we really want to teach them how to be a member of a community. And that's a big part of what we're doing with recovery housing is we're not just getting them sober. We're helping them create lives that are worth staying in recovery for most importantly, and, and, and secondly, we're helping them learn to be a type of person that many of them have never been before, where they've had stable employment and they've showed up in their roles as mothers and fathers and parents and employees and, and, and whatever, you know, all of these different aspects that they've never experienced because drugs and alcohol was, was really the, in, the, the whole focus. Um, so I just wanna say that if, if you are a community member, um, wherever you are, this experience for us in itself is a big thing because this is a very diverse platform that this conference is reaching. And so any, any group um, that is willing to have us come down and, and talk about recovery housing and, and about certification, because chances are somebody you know might need it. And we wanna help people know that it's there and why we do what we do and, and, and where to find certified houses when they need them. Um, and that they do have options. So um, again, I post in my email in the chat. So anybody that wants to reach out, please feel free. Thank you, Sarah and, and Terry and, and Susie for having us on here. I appreciate you. Well, thank you all for taking your time out of your busy days because I, I know from listening that you have very busy days. So I appreciate um, all the time that you put into this. And if anyone has any questions, please add them to the chat. We can contact everyone if need be. And we appreciate your time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope you're able to participate in some of the other events that we will be having through the week.